So Richie, you sent me a couple of days ago uh, a cut from Liebman's album that you were on called Sweet Hands. You sent me the track Dr. Faustus. And you know, as I'm listening to this, I can't help see how in 1975, you guys were heavily influenced by Miles and Bitches Brew and On the Corner and, and that era of Miles. And so I thought it would be kind of interesting for you to talk a little about the influence that Miles had at that time, specifically, you know, Bitches Brew, and, you know, how that came about and what the innovation of that album really was. So can you tell us a little about that? Well, Bitches Brew... In 1969, this was a spectacular um, moment for Miles, okay? Because Miles was always aware of what was going on around him. He was aware of trends, politically, musically, of course. Just he was, um, he was not like isolated jazz talent player just coming out to play in your high, okay? He watched a lot of TV during the day. And he wanted to always do something different. You've got to understand this about Miles. It was not like Dizzy or Bill or even Cecil Taylor. They directed something when they were young and they refined it their own life. They didn't change. Dizzy didn't change. Neither did Bill really so much or Cecil. I'm talking about developmental artists like Beethoven, Picasso, Monet. Look at Monet's early shit. Portraits. Okay, nice. Look at the look at the end. He painted the water, the water lilies. He got deep into the water. This is tremendous developmental shit. Listen to Beethoven. Early Beethoven, Mozart. Okay, it's supposed to be. Middle Beethoven. He's already letting go of a lot of unnecessary forms. Late Beethoven is unbelievable. Thirty second piano sonata. Dion. It's in two movements. The early sonatas are in four or five movements. Here you have the first sonata form with the melody and the exposition, blah. Now you have a, the second movement, which is scherzo, and now that was a slow movement and then a fast movement. It was a mold. That's why they wrote hundreds of sonatas, because it was a mold. They told and said, no, man, no. They made tremendous innovations in terms of form. Two movements. In the end of the sonata. And then Liz came along and said, I'm going to do a one movement sonata with the B minor sonata. Beginning of the contemporary writing, which set the way for the Berg sonata in one movement. Miles was looking for trends. And he also, this is part of his personality, he was pissed that he was opening up for Black Sabbath or ACDC in the Fillmore, and he was making, say, 20000 and the rock band was making 80000 because they filled the stadium. And Miles was the most popular jazz artist, but, was, you know, the popularity of jazz was nothing. It was like fingernail. And he didn't just sell out because he wanted to make money. He did want to make money, and he did sell out, especially at the end when he was playing Cindy Operations. But bitches brew. And all those records with Lead and On the Corner and Decoy, these are serious fusion records with, with a backbeat, but not a dancehall, and with great solos, and jazz solos, and great harmony. In a silent way, which is brutal. It was, it was kind of tribal shit. It was orchestrated. And Miles was the director. This is what changed. Up until 1969, Miles was the leader. He picked the best cats, the best, and after a solo, walked off the stage. Very generous, because he was always, everyone looking at him. He let the musicians shine. Jack and Herbie and Jack and Tony. And he'd come back on the play, and then he'd go to the next step. That by the change, he wanted to be the leader. He wanted to be seen as the leader. So he was there the whole time, and directing, directing. He got uh, Al Foster or the, the, other, the other Germans, and he shaped the music himself. He got guys that he could control. You think that if, if uh, he was self telling Jack and Chick what to play and Wayne, they would be looking? No. He knew enough not to do that. He took young cats. He 
cast that were in it. And Bitches Through is really interesting record. Not every night. I'm not going to put it on like Fun Valentine or around midnight. But Paraphernalia, when they're for Kitty, those you can listen to a thousand times. And I do. They bear repeated living because of the incredible quality. Bitches Brew was like a giant action painting compared to a portrait, right? And Miles put a stamp on it. It's not real melodies. The rhythm is king. The rhythm. And Miles is still Miles. Plus, he loved all the electronic shit. He loved the Rob Lyle, which a lot of people thought destroyed his sound. No, I didn't think so. It was fine. He had guitar players. I mean, with me, there were two guitar players or three guitar players, electric bass players. He had an interesting band with Michael Henderson playing electric bass and Keith playing that piece of shit, orange bar piece of organ that sounds terrible. But Keith played some fantastic stuff with that. Very interesting with Gary Barnes before David. But Miles wanted to play the big places. He wanted get over to big audiences. And like, you know, like you say, there's an audience there that maybe would love it if he did it. And of course, it's just Drew and Silent Way sold 400,000. Never did he sold 5,000 copies. Okay? As great a record as that one. So there's something about it was a backbeat. It was not danceable really, but it was within the frame of reference for the same kids that were listening to Cream or you know, Santana, you know what I'm saying? And he, he became part of that. Oh, Miles Davis, yeah. Miles Davis, wow, Miles Davis. They did, these kids, they didn't know his early stuff, and they didn't care. They loved this other stuff. Miles was very smart, too. He went to Japan and played six concerts for a million dollars concert. Not just for him, but for the band. It was great. It was great for him. You know, you want to see somebody like that. In other words, it was not a big soloist gig anymore. It was, it, it was not like a jazz gig. Okay. But there are some records on like Decoy that are fantastic. But Skull and Branford, it's killing. On the Corner is great. I love the day solo. I love the, the flow of that record. But then that grew to three guitars and leave and, and, you know, it just became a massive sound that was fantastic to listen to, maybe live or high, but to me, its value as to bear repeated listening is something very deep. I mean, you know, we listen to Bill and we listen to Miles. Now, was an influence? Holy shit. <laughs> Miles was first, and then Weather Report with Wayne, of course, Joe Sabino, the cats. The original Weather Report was Eric Bill by Miroslav Beaches. Okay? And wait. That was a great band, too. And more, it, it, it finally it, it did settle on Jack Owen Pierce and, or Alex Jr. It was fantastic. It had Wayne's and Joe's writing. This was not influenced by Miles because these are still tunes. Miles sit with stamps and fragments of melodies and feelings. Let the report with tunes. A remark you made amazing to Cannonball, Salmon's incredible ballad. It was still tunes, it was great, and they were burning, and electric piano, and, 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 and. Funky. Look, Lafayette, La Vigino. Okay? Remember, all these cats were on the bitches' group. Miles was a father, a grandfather. So they each took what they wanted and put out a fusion band. Us too. Dave was with Miles, so we, we he put together a lookout for him with me. With Frank Tucson, Jeff Williams, and Bob Roy. That's the shit I sent you. And we were electric piano, acoustic bass, electric bass, you know, tablas. We were doing half jazz and half fusion. I loved it. Plus, the way we're playing uh, uh, on, on, on the funk stuff is not exactly sliding the stone. I was playing long, complicated solos just over that beat. It was fun. It's no compromise. Plus, the truth is, in those days traveling, we traveled all over the United States. Not so many great style days for us, anyway. Okay? So, lucky I had to collect your piano. At least it was in two, it sounded great. 
Then there was other bands. I mean, we tried to forever, okay? They did their shit. That turned into a monster, a romantic warrior and gigantic stadium stuff. I never liked that stuff. But God bless them. People liked it. Good. I'm happy. Randy and Michael had a, a fusion band. Of course, George Duke had a band. There was some other, other groups, but that was basically it. Yeah, we were all at that time children of Pitches Brew, Silent Way, Fusion, Miles. That was, that was it. That was the way to play. Of course, except for Keith yeah. and McCoy. McCoy never played in the channel. If he did, he'd probably smash it by accident. <laughs> okay. So Keith would made a big stand with the acoustic piano, which was fantastic. The point is, all the people that were playing that shit stopped playing electric stuff. You know, Mavisu McLaughlin went back to Shakti, all acoustic, went the other way. All right? Look at Farm became Quest, all acoustic. It was a trend. It was a thing. It was fun. It was different. It was a bandwagon, and people loved it. But then it was over. Like bebop ran out of out of, out of gas. It was it was fantastic. It began innovatively, and then it became mainstream, and then it became nostalgic. This is history. That's the way things happen, right? And it's to Miles' great credit that he saw that shit. He created the trend. Okay. First he said jazz, okay? Then he said, mm, jazz with electric piano, but still jazz. I'm checking it. Then he said, jazz fusion. Then he said, the jazz. The only meaning of the jazz was that there was elements of improvisation. That's all. But the surrounding colors were modern, modern day. Now it all sounds very dated and coined. It's fine. I always think what Miles would be doing now, because he never wants to go back and do anything again. They asked him a thousand times. The only thing he did three weeks before he died, Quincy asked him to do Miles of the Montreux, which was the sketch in Spain and that shit. And he reluctantly did it. He did it for Quincy. And I'm glad he did it. But he, he's dead three weeks after that tragic. Hmm. But Richard Boo had tremendous influence. He was just wonderful, positive influence on a lot, a lot of our lives. Of course, there's, there's a nostalgia retro thing where people want to get the electric piano and that kind of vibe, but that's all after the fact. You know, it's like you can't go back because the music is a product of the times. Yeah, man. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs>